My name is Jane Tarr. I taught children and young people with social and emotional difficulties before moving into higher education as a teacher trainer and researcher into inclusive education. At the University of the West of England, Bristol, I became director of Teachers Continuing Professional Development. I'm now a qualified music therapist with experience of working with young people in schools and clinical settings. And my name is Nick Clough. I taught in inner urban primary schools before moving into teacher education. First as a local education authority advisory teacher and then within the university sector. At the University of the West of England, Bristol, I became Director of Initial Teacher Education. I currently work as a professional development advisor and community musician. I was coordinator of the Erasmus Plus Link project that's referred to in this presentation. The book that we're talking about with you today is called Addressing Issues of Mental Health in Schools Through the Arts, Teachers and Music Therapists Working Together. The book reports on an Erasmus Plus funded project entitled Learning in a New Key, Link, which brought music and arts-based therapists to, to work together with teachers in support of young people with social, emotional and mental health concerns. The main text reports on classroom-based research and interventions in a residential special school in southwest England. The complementary work of teachers and music therapists from Portugal, Poland and Italy is also featured. The focus of this presentation about the book will be the 10 main chapters reporting on the classroom-based research and interventions that took place in the UK. We will first offer a summary of the underlying problems that the book identifies and addresses. Teachers working in schools in the UK and the wider European region find it challenging to include all children and young people in learning experiences in their classrooms. This applies particularly for learners with social and emotional and mental health concerns. This issue lies at the heart of the discussions in the book. We ask the question, how can social and emotional access to learning be provided within the classroom? Many strategies that are effective in addressing issues of mental health are implemented by specialists outside of the classroom. The discussions in this new book focus on complementary measures that teachers themselves can introduce inside the classroom as part of educational provision. The book emphasises the significance of creating spaces inside the classroom where shared relational health can flourish. The book documents research into embodied music and arts-based experiences that have provided momentary recovery within the learning environment. The book documents how the issue of young people's mental health is of growing concern in the European region. The World Health Organization European Wide Action Plan for Mental Health 2013 to 2020 identified that mental health disorders, including high levels of depression and anxiety in children and young people, were one of the top public health challenges in the European region. The OECD PISA report has identified serious levels of anxiety and bullying amongst children in developed countries. Waters outlines a wide range of further current factors affecting the mental health of young people and their capacity to engage as learners in school. These include their concerns about the sustainability of life on the planet and their negative experience of social media interactions. As we were writing the book, young people's experiences of the COVID-19 pandemic introduced further layers of complexity in assessing their mental health as increased levels of poverty, social isolation and domestic risk impacted variably on different groups. There are significant numbers of children and young people in the European region with high incidence of adverse childhood experiences, summarised as ACEs, who require support not only through appropriate health provision but also within the daily routines of school classrooms. However, 
Not all mental health concerns arise from such experiences. Biological and genetic factors can contribute to the complexity of diagnosis. The professional training activities described in the book supported teachers' understanding of the causal factors that underlie presenting signs of social, emotional and mental health concerns. The discussion in the book about the research and intervention activities focus on efforts to overcome the resulting difficulties experienced by young people in the classroom and the associated barriers to their inclusion. Those highlighted in bold text on this slide here have been the main topics. Distractibility during the learning experience, relating to adults, relating to peers, self-regulation, sensory processing and transitions into the learning environment. While addressing these concerns can support the development of young people's cognitive capacities, we have not defocused on supporting young people to understand their feelings, which we consider to lie more within the remit of the therapist working in a one-to-one -one way. In summary, the research in the book begins to clarify the kinds of professional, knowledge, skills, ways of being and ways of living alongside others that teachers require in order to respond to the learning needs of children and young people whose social, emotional and mental health concerns are often the result of adverse childhood experiences, including trauma, deprivation and other life, and other life experiences. The young people included in this research project in the UK were all presenting signs of social, emotional and mental health concern, often resulting from earlier traumatic experiences. Their common interest was seeking and finding spaces and social relationships in which they could feel safe. They began to participate as collaborative music makers in the classroom. This graphic image is taken from a descriptive report of a critical classroom episode taking place on 7th of February 2018, 8.50 to 9.30. The legend will help you to identify the roles of those presented. An extract from the narrative account reads as follows. Before the session, at the routine morning meeting for teachers, three of the young people in the class, young person one, YP3 and YP6, were separately identified in reports from care staff as having experienced high states of anxiety during the previous night and early morning. You can see in the graphic image that these three young people were still distressed when they arrived in the classroom. Young person one is sitting alone on the floor in the corner of the room. Young person three has his head on the desk. Young person six is standing up and arguing with young person five. You can imagine that the two teachers were wondering what they could do to support them to join the lesson. Jane is represented as MT, music therapist, and Nick by TR, teacher trainer. In the book, we draw on findings from many other music arts therapy research projects. For example, the positive impact of the arts for young people experiencing trauma. Malchiodi, creating cultures in schools, music cultures in schools, Rickson, the impact of group music making on young people's mood changes, Schumann, the relationship between music and mental health for adolescents, McFerrin. The impact of music in our lives continues to be an area of fascination for academics and musicians researching from the perspectives of psychology, pedagogy, sociology and musicology. Their inquiries include exploring musical applications within neuroscience research, noting the organic links between children's innate musicality and their development, differentiating nuances between the educational and therapeutic values of music 
within communities. While we report how the status of music and the arts in schools is under threat in the UK, we note at the same time that a report from the European Regional Office of the World Health Organization has provided evidence from 3,000 studies about the major role played by the arts and music in promoting health and well-being and in managing and treating the effects of illness across the human lifespan. The design of the LINK project recognised the need for classroom-based research to promote understanding of the power of music and the arts in supporting young people's well-being and their access to learning. The LINK project provided opportunities for teachers and music therapists to develop inquiries together about the impact of collaborative music making and communicative musicality at a time when music and the arts in schools were at a low ebb and concerns about the mental health of children and young people were at a high tide mark. We need to share with you some information about the work of music therapists who were invited to contribute to the work of the LINK project. A music therapist has professional knowledge and understanding that listening to different kinds of music can soothe, calm, excite or energise the listener and has the professional skills to stimulate music making with others as a means for connecting, communicating and expressing feelings and ideas. Such insights are built upon psychological and musicological knowledge and inform the therapeutic use of music in all contexts, including schools. We recognise the need for interprofessional practice in the LINK project, for teachers and music therapists to work together. The design of the LINK project provided teachers and music arts therapists to come together with opportunities to research what aspects of music therapy work could be incorporated into the social and learning context of the classroom. We recognise that music therapists have been working to support teachers and children and young people in schools for many years. However, a more recent review of research literature in this field found that much of the work was understandably focused on the needs of the young people. The reviewers recommended that such initiatives should also address the professional learning needs of teachers in order to ensure that music making is sustained after the music therapist has left the classroom. They, Steele and others, identified that a stronger focus on teacher-preferred strategies may enhance their confidence in becoming independent music makers in classrooms and honour the agency of teachers as professionals. This concern lay at the root of our decision to work with participatory action research approaches, encouraging interprofessional collaboration. This slide introduces you to the participants in the UK LINK project. They included 10 teachers working in a residential day special school in a total of five classrooms. Two trainers, that was the two of us, providing classroom-based training sessions, 100 plus over two years. Two music therapy trainers providing training support for whole group training sessions eight away from the classroom, and 30 plus young people placed within the chosen five classrooms. Participatory Action Research, PAR for short, was identified as a means to support equitable interaction between the practitioners involved, that is, between the teachers, the music therapists and teacher trainers. To borrow from the imagery used by Chevalier and Buckles, the LINK project provided a range of opportunities like special crossroads on the learning pathways that would bring participants together. They wrote, PAR is an invitation sent to people whose life spaces may intersect around shared concerns. Those who accept the invitation meet at agreed crossroads and choose to interact according to shared rules, but they do so 
with many other considerations in mind. The gathering is like a nexus, a focus point, where lines and paths intersect for a period of time. All those taking part spend time at this junction, but the way that they interact, the things they do, and the rules they follow are directly affected by their respective origins and destinations, and the many other people that they interact with. The team of teachers, music therapists, teacher trainers and music therapy trainers were able to meet in various ways, including during whole group training sessions, classroom-based trainings and shared reflective meetings. The action inquiries, reflections and professional learning took place in all of these mentioned sites. The arrows on the table below represent how the documentation of these experiences informed subsequent experiences in, other, in the other sites of professional learning, supporting the formation of ideas, the enactment of them and the realisation of changes. The promotion of this kind of interprofessional practice was recognised as timely in light of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number three. SDG three is about good health and well-being to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. The subsequent related complementary guidance outlines the need worldwide to develop competence in systems thinking, collaborative working and integrated problem solving to promote good health and well-being for all. A few words first to establish the principles that underpin the participatory action research approaches that are described in the book. PAR is conducting action research with people rather than for them or about them. PAR is collective reasoning and evidence-based learning focused on social action. PAR is intended for use by researchers, students and working professionals seeking to improve or rethink their approach to co-creating knowledge and supporting action for the well-being of all. Preparing ethical protocols for such interprofessional research was complex and involved reference to multiple professional codes as illustrated in this slide. These included professional guidelines from education, from psychology and from counselling and psychotherapy. So here is a summary of the participation, the action and the research. Teachers, music therapists, teacher trainers and music therapy trainers were all participating in the research process. The action involved weekly classroom-based sessions with young people, weekly reflective meetings with teachers after school, and regular whole group training days with the teachers. The research process meant that these actions were fully documented to support the participation's reflection and analysis. Here we can see how Kolb's cycle of experiential learning influenced the interprofessional research process. Firstly, concrete experience. Here, new practices were introduced by music therapists, teachers and a teacher trainer working together with the young people. These were documented and shared to support collaborative recall and reflection. This provided opportunity for joint reflection. The teacher's own professional knowledge, skills, interests and traditions were valued as starting points for further reflection alongside the music therapists and teacher trainers. These reflections provided opportunity for shared abstract conceptualisation about what had happened in the classroom. The first level into professional reflections gave rise to new forms of theorising that drew on both therapeutic and educational perspectives and resources. This encouraged further active experimentation 
new actions in the classroom that encourage through this experiential action-based interprofessional inquiry. These experiences were reviewed in ways that led to further professional experimentation and learning. The interprofessional collaboration resulted in creating the framework for participation presented in this slide. It represents new spaces for young people that were created in the classroom and outlines how the musical experience developed during the 100 plus classroom based trainings involving the various professionals and young people together. In essence, they all gradually became music makers who valued the beneficial outcomes for their well-being. All these different dimensions were significant. The organisation of space, listening time, an introductory event, exploration of instruments, turn-taking games, dialogic pair work, leading musical improvisation, conducting, free musical improvisation and ending activities. The use of reflexive products in the LINK project has represented a starting point for transgressing professional boundaries. The adjective reflexive is chosen to convey the intention that new actions, practices, and new theorising about actions, praxis, will derive from contact with such products. The effect of reflexivity is that the action turns back on the subjects and generates a new response from them. Reflexive products are research instruments that are sufficiently imbued with the experience of the enactments with the effect that the participants' professional selves and actions are recognised known again, reviewed, put in a new perspective, and re-articulated, conjoined with new ways of understanding networks of possibility. Reflexive products were intended to encourage active and critical readership of the data emerging from the study and to facilitate interprofessional talk and collaboration. A first step towards portraying the classroom activities was to create notes after the activity about key features and timings, e.g. the introductory activity, subsequent group activities and observed changes in the moods of the young people and all their levels of engagement. These descriptive notes were then used immediately to prepare a full narrative description. The narrative accounts were complemented by six sketches of what happened in the classroom. The music therapist completed these immediately after each session. For the purposes of the book, these sketches have been carefully refashioned by a graphic artist, Nina Sutcliffe. Here is an extract from the narrative and graphic account of the critical classroom episode that took place on the 22nd of February 2017 between 1.30 and 2 o'clock. It is complemented by a graphic representation that could support teachers to recognise, review and re-articulate this emerging classroom practice. Activity 2. Music making, leading improvisation using an instrument. 1.40 to 1.46. Young person 43 had chosen the kazoo and used it to lead an improvised piece. The group followed him, playing loudly and then faster when he played in these ways on the kazoo. As the piece began to slow down, a distinctive interaction took place between young person 41, playing the owl whistle, and young person 43 on the kazoo. These two young people played responsively together on these blown instruments for about three minutes the piece of music gradually came to an end. YP42 then led an improvised piece playing the balafon in an imaginative manner using both beaters. 
The group members, including YP37, YP41 and YP43, were able to follow the rhythmic patterns he created. He related his musical playing to the sounds made by the musical music therapist, who was playing a drum. He listened carefully to the rhythmic patterns she was creating and followed all the rhythmic changes she made. Within a short time, the music therapist on drum and YP42 on balafon were playing very closely together, alternating the lead through the rhythmic shapes that they provided. Other players in the group recognised the excitement of this dyadic work and part participated by following the rhythmic shapes initiated by YP42 and the music therapist. A cohesive and rhythmically coordinated group improvisation was created. Together we have captured the sensory and relational aspects of the musical experience as a means to explore the efficacy of the interventions in providing social and emotional access to learning. We based our observations of young people during music making sessions on variables drawn from the theory of flow developed by Chitsun Mihai 25 years ago. There is insufficient time during this presentation to explore this aspect of our work that included the development and use of observable indicators relevant to young people's needs within a new observation schedule that focused on their engagement in music. This is described in detail in the book. We can note in summary, however, that the observation schedule yielded these findings. The music arts-based therapeutic teaching practices, one, engaged the young people through providing multi-sensory experiences, two, stimulated young people's focused attention, three, supported young people to exercise safe measures of control over the situation, four, provided opportunities for practicing self-regulation and self-correction, five, encouraged young people to participate purposefully from their own volition, six, facilitated young people's safe responsiveness to each other, seven, provided opportunities for restorative non-verbal dialogic interactions between young people and adult staff members. During the new music arts-based therapeutic teaching practices, young people practice necessary social skills, experience and recognize positive mood changes, exercise improved levels of self-control, related to others more successfully, enjoyed themselves and expressed pleasure. The five case studies that are presented in the book provide a framework for understanding the outcomes of this interprofessional discussion and reflections. These include, firstly, group music making as a social process to support relational health. Secondly, the value of multi-sensory experience in the classroom to encourage engagement. Thirdly, understanding dialogic interactions during music-based therapeutic teaching practices. Fourthly, creative attachment focused therapy practices. And fifth, protective and healing music arts based interventions as an entitlement for young people. We'll continue to share data and reflections from the case study four related to creative attachment focused therapy practices. Here are the six pictures presented in the graphic account of this classroom based training, together with the short explanatory headings as presented in the book. It'll help us to understand what happened in the classroom. 1. YPs are encouraged to join a circle of chairs with instruments placed in the centre. 2. Young people are invited to choose an instrument. 3. YP43 plays tunes on the kazoo and harmonica for his teacher to identify. YP55 and YP22 
are seated at their desks. Four, group improvisation led to close musical interaction between YP-43 playing kazoo and YP-41 playing the owl whistle. Five, YP-42 leads an improvisation with the group while closely matching the playing of the music therapist. Six, YP-62 shares a piece of music she's identified on the computer for the group to listen to. Here's an extract now from the reflections of the music therapist that were later shared with the teachers. These reflections opened up discussions about music-based creative attachment focused therapeutic practice. This session drew upon strategies from creative attachment focused therapy that encourage emotional connectedness and attentive engagement with others through music-based interventions informed by psychological insights about early attachment. The young people's experience can be viewed from the perspective of those music, art, dance and movement therapists whose collaborative work provides healing services for families of adopted or fostered children with fragile and challenging communication skills resulting from their insecure attachments. Such playful and creative attachment-focused approaches are seen as stimulating what Stern calls vitality effects that can in turn encourage moments of quality interaction between parents and their children. Vitality effects compromise five elements, movement, force, space, intention and time. Stern refers to them as the stuff that music creates and plays with, and it's what we, in communicating with one another, create and play with. Here's an extract from the reflections of the teacher trainer that was shared with the teachers. It opens up discussions about how to ensure young people's inclusion through providing flexible arrangements. These reflections also clarify that the activities can be justified in educational terms. The musical activity provided an inclusive framework for focusing the young people's attention despite the challenges being experienced at the time. For example, two of the young people, YP22 and YP55, who did not wish to choose or play an instrument, were engaged in complementary arts activities that bridged with the main musical activities, allowing them to participate as listeners. The group improvisations provided space for the other young people to listen, to take turns, to imitate one another, to respond to musical changes introduced by another, and to respect each other's contributions within the social group. These are all skills required within successful verbal communication and practice of them is a standard educational provision. The young people were rehearsing these interactive skills in a non-verbal manner. We will now share further examples of outcomes from the research. We're going to focus on new professional competences that were emerging and we'll illustrate how reflections about the new practices related to specifically here, creative attachment focused interventions in the classroom, were used as a basis for identifying and naming new professional ways of knowing, of doing, of being, and of living alongside others. This framework of competences was used as a device to capture the discussions of the new emerging professional capacities. The framework differentiates professional learning about how to know, about how to do, about how to be, and about how to live alongside others within the music making experiences with the young people. The themes identified on the vertical axis were seen to be relevant to the needs of the young people. They include reference to safety, resilience, trauma-informed teaching, attachment-focused and relationship-based teaching, and ethical practice. 
As part of the process of reflection, a summative analysis of each part of the session was prepared for sharing with the teachers. Here is one example. The young people, teachers and music therapists are sitting in a circle and participating in music making together. Secure relationships are being established through safe, inclusive and interactive musical experiences. Young person 42 here is enjoying moments of playfulness with the music therapist in the context of taking a lead in, in, in a group improvisation from his balafon. The music therapist is encouraging antiphonal responses from young person 42 to support his non-verbal communicative music making, while also, with support from the two teachers, observing and engaging with the other young people's musical responses and moods. With respect to attachment-focused and relationship-based teaching, the following interprofessional competences were identified and named. Learning how to know, 5a, recognising and understanding the impact of insecure attachment on the learning process. Learning how to do, 5c, creating educational rationales that legitimate multisensory and relational classroom activities. 5d, observing and engaging with young people's responses and moods while listening to music and making music together. Learning how to be, 5e, being playful with the social opportunities of antiphonal and synchronous musical interactions. Learning how to live alongside others. 5f, recognising the power of sitting in a circle and participating in music making together. 5g, integrating principles of safety, inclusion and interaction within the shared music arts-based experiences to encourage secure relationships. Now, and with respect to the first theme, different elements of safety, emotional, social, physical, moral, spiritual and psychological safety, the following interprofessional competences were identified and named. Learning how to know. 1a. Recognising how music arts-based experiences provide a safe environment for some young people. Learning how to do. 1b. Selecting and using music effectively to support safe transitions into shared learning spaces. Learning how to be. 1c. Appreciating that feelings of well-being can be mediated through music arts-based experiences. Learning how to live alongside others. 1d. Learning about cultural empathy in practice as a basis for supporting developing feelings of safety. During this session, the practices of the teachers were beginning to exemplify these qualities. During the same session, and with respect to the second theme, music-centred and arts-based experiences and emotional content, the following new capacities were identified. 2b. Engaging in critical evaluation of classroom experiences, synthesising criteria from education, arts-based therapies and psychology. 2e. Recognising how educational and therapeutic processes for young people can be synthesised through music, arts-based experiences. 2f. Recognising the processes of mirroring and matching within music making. 2i. Attuning to dialogic spaces created through non-verbal communicative music making. 2J, recognising collaborative, communicative music making as an inclusive and restorative process. Again, the teachers were beginning to exemplify these qualities in their work and to learn how to give them a name. With respect to the third theme, understanding vulnerable young people's emotional response to learning and change and their capacity for resilience and self-regulation. These combined new knowledges, knowledges, skills and ways of being were in evidence. 
3A, recognising and understanding how students' difficulties can be rooted in their past experiences. 3D, developing skills in observation to recognise and assess young people's emotional states as they engage with music arts-based experiences. 3F, being open to moments of resilience that can arise from engagement in music arts-based experiences. A summative finding reported in the book is that all this can happen inside the classroom. The experience of social and emotional inclusion can be held by the same teacher who has responsibility for holding the learning experiences. It's made possible through the introduction of non-verbal music and arts experiences, supported by the interprofessional work of teachers and music arts therapists, sharing and reapplying practical knowledge and psychological insights that are already available.